Welcome everyone to Ladder Daily Digest. Today we have uh, Carrie Schertz, the backyard professor, and Summer Rain joins me with as a co-host. And Carrie, tell us about your Mormon story. Well, okay. Um, I was born and raised Mormon um, back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, I had a I had a great childhood. I was involved with the back then it was with the cub scouts and the boy scouts and you know um pinewood we had derbies. pinewood derbies oh boy those were fun years weren't they i loved pinewood derby i never won i took third once and i thought i was el macho scout boy but it was it was pretty fun but uh i was actually one of those there were a couple of years i confess that i i had some help carving my car yeah yeah but um I was one of those that actually tried to carve my own car. So it made it a lot of fun. And of course I came in overweight every time and we had to pre-drill out the bottom end of it, you know, stuff like that. So, but it was a lot of fun, but uh, yeah, we had the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts and uh, my childhood in Mormonism was a blast. I had so much fun. Uh, I, I had lots of friends. Um, I did have some non-member friends. Uh, we all just kind of, in our neighborhood, we all just kind of hung out. We, we didn't care what religion you were until, of course, you got into the cemetery years, the seminary years, and uh, started distinguishing between the righteous Nephites and the wicked Lamanites. The Lamanites, of course, being the non-members and the Nephites being the members. Of course, and you know, being the raised heathens, in the Gentiles. Yeah, yeah. The gen e even even the Jews were not as righteous as we were. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, they were the chosen people, but we have the priesthood, you know. That's and true. that's what they taught us, right? I mean, in seminary, I did go through four years of seminary, had a ball, got along well with all my instructors. I was one of those kids that uh, I actually, uh, you know, each year you do, uh, one of the books of scripture, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Old Testament, then New Testament. And they would give us the incentive, you know, well, if you'll read the scripture, um, we'll let you sign your name to this letter that we're going to send in to the prophet and he'll be able to read your name. And I said, oh, I'm so there. So, of course, I read the scriptures for all the wrong reasons, but I got my name on that letter every year for four times in a row. So, so the Spend prophet knew. Spencer W. Kimball knew who I was. And in fact, I ended up getting his signature when he personally called me on a mission in that form letter. That they sent it's out. like it's like the Mormonism version of Santa. It's like naughty, <laughs> nice list. He knows who he knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you're reading your scriptures. He knows when I you're mean, going on a mission. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good way to put it, Summer. That's very good. Good perception. Yeah. Yeah. We uh we had I I actually I think it was my junior year. Uh my seminary teacher was so cool that even during lunch at school, um, I don't know if we had early release time or not, uh, but we did have it in the morning. But even at noon, I would go back over to the seminary building and have lunch with, there were quite a group of us that used to hang out in the seminary yeah. building, play ping pong, you know, or sit there and practice scripture chase, which I never did get uh, totally good at. Sometimes I won, sometimes I didn't, but, you know, it was fun. It was a good wasn't time it, in my childhood. Wasn't that um, the enlightened era of the church where they were kind of very open to nuanced thinking and questions and things like that? Oh, or am I thinking of a different, that's a different time. That's was a that different time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. McConkie. There's the McConkie. word. Yeah, that, was that, that was the era I was raised up in. Yeah. Got it. We're okay. trying to talk to Mormon doctrine. We are correct, brethren. We have the priesthood of Got Almighty it. God, and the world is apostate. Yes. And Got I it. read his Mormon doctrine on my mission. I really did. I all the way through. Used it to prepare talks. Yeah. Mormon yeah. doctrine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mormon doctrine was that one, and uh, I actually really did enjoy. Uh, Jesus the Christ. Uh, look, look, yeah, the Grand Richard. 
a marvelous Grand work. Richards. Marvelous he, he work was, in the yeah, he, he was more down to our level than uh, James E. Talmadge. But I will confess, on my mission, I went to Missouri, St. Louis, and on my mission, 1979 to 1981, I actually really did read James Talmadge's Jesus the Christ twice. Wow. I had, I had a pocket edition. It was, it was just small enough that I could open up my lapel and stick it in my side pocket. And so, and it was a real thick, it was a black leather bound. I've got it here somewhere. I haven't seen it for years, but yeah, I, it's probably over there next to my German edition. Wow, leather bound. That's serious. Yeah, yeah. Someone gave it to me as a gift before I went on my mission. And I, I ended up, I, I got Jesus. The, it was a combined Jesus the Christ Articles of Faith. And then I got uh, Le Grand Richard's Marvelous Work and Wonder in a pocket mm -hmm edition leather bound that I carried with me. And I read those constantly while I was tracting in between houses, you know, stuff like that, waiting for the bus, you know, my companions thought I was ridiculous, but you know, who cares what they thought? Well, Let's go tracting because, elder. Yeah. You're about to get translated. <laughs> who cares what these other missionaries think? Oh, you're going to be you know, out of I, here any second. I hate to confess this, but I actually thought I was righteous enough at one point to be translated. I, 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 you know, some of us have egoitis that I was guilty of, especially in my first ward after I came home off my mission, of course. But yeah, um, I had a did good you, childhood. I can't complain. Did you do a local college or did you go? I to did. BYU? Yeah. Uh, I went to Rick's which is BYU-Idaho now. Um, I think they were the Vikings back then. They were, yeah, Rick's College Vikings. And it's real crazy because they they got rid of the football team after we were there, which really sucked. But it, it's all good. It was fun. Um, and I enjoyed Rick's. It was at Rick's, actually. Now, I went to, uh, after I got home off my mission, I ended up uh, getting married and I went to college while I was married. So I just commuted back and forth. I didn't have all of the glorious, you know, people babysitting you in the apartments, making sure the girls were out by 8 PM and no shenanigans and all that silly noise, the babysitting aspect of the college. Uh, I didn't have to worry about. So I could focus more on my studies and it was at Rick's. Uh, actually, it was on my mission when I discovered Hugh Nibley and his writings. And of course, the famous one with the missionaries was the Myth Makers. That was yeah. the that was the anti Mormon kill book. That one and uh, uh, Orson Pratt's uh, the writings. Can't remember what they called it, the writings of Orson Pratt or sermons and writings of Orson Pratt. I I read him. I, I was so blown away at the power of his presentation of the logic of the biblical doctrine supporting Mormonism. I read him over and over again. And but I discovered Hugh Nibley, and I I was just astonished at the power of his writing. I actually got into him almost backwards than I should have. There was a member out in, uh, I was in a part of Illinois, uh, Peoria, Illinois, and there was a medical doctor who was a member, and he really loved Hugh Nibley. He let me borrow Nibley's book since Camorra. And I don't know if you guys have ever read that or not. I read that as a missionary. I wasn't supposed to, so I'm confessing a bad sin, which, of course, I was stupid enough to confess to my mission president after my mission, and he tusk tusked me, you know. He said that was a naughty thing to do, Elder. I said it kept me on my mission, though. Um, and so I bowed to the Lord. I said, look, if you'll let me find a way to get everything this man wrote, I will defend the church like he's doing. And that was kind of the beginning at Rick's college. Now, wow. Incense Camorra, Incense Camorra in the footnotes in the book, they were a series of articles in the improvement era. And then they just put them all into book form, right? Mm -hmm. So 
in the footnotes, I could see, oh, he's got another article on baptism for the dead in the improvement era. And, oh, he's got another article he's referring to, the, the stick of Joseph and stick of Judah, and that's in the improvement era. And, oh, he's got another one, howlers in the Book of Mormon in the millennials. So anyway, through reading since Camorra, I realized this man had written a whole bunch more stuff. And so when I got to cross you started cross-referencing Hugh Nibley and yes. looking at the footnotes and just started cross-referencing that. Yes. And when I got to Rick's college, I was absolutely elated. I was more elated in the library at Rick's college that was an open book library than I was in the celestial room of the, of the temple wow. because all of the improvement eras were, were open and available. Wow. And I photocopied every single one of Hugh Nibley's articles. A nickel or a dime a copy. No, no, they weren't they weren't a dime. It was like I uh I had a librarian. I worked in the library to help pay for my schooling, and then afterward I would stay there and photocopy a couple of articles each night and then go home, right? Because it was like a half hour commute. So what I did was um I got in real good with a librarian and she helped me see how she taught me on the photocopy machine how to shrink just a little bit the size of the print on the yeah. paper. 92%. And I, yes, yes. And then I could lay the book out flat and I could photocopy two pages from oh, the okay. price one. So like 60%. Nice. Yeah, right. And, I remember doing something like that. And then she showed me how to do both sides. So that it wasn't that expensive. And I absolutely copied everything I could get my hands on from Nibley. And and so that was kind of the beginning of my uh, continuation of my adult education once I got through the silliness of what Rick's College was offering. Because I told, I, I told the Lord, I said, look, this stuff turns me on. I love this stuff. I will, I will uh Basically, I stayed on my mission for years and years and years. Well, four and a half years afterward, went through a horrible divorce. <laughs> and my my thinking is I, I'm willing to take half the blame. I, I, I truly am. I mean, number one, we were both too young. We, we didn't have a pee picking clue what the hell we were doing, right? We didn't know how to be parents. We didn't know how to be husband and wife. Uh, all we knew is, well, we're supposed to keep going to church together, you know, and we yeah. didn't even, you know, we didn't do the shopping together right. She was a mama's girl. She always wanted to go to mom's to eat. And anyway, so through time, I ended up in a divorce and I felt so cotton picking guilty that I told the Lord, I will defend the church if you will forgive me all of my sins, you know, I'm going to stay on my mission here. So I began a correspondence with several different ministers and pastors mm -hmm. in my hometown and started mm. talking. And fighting, then, fighting the, the local yeah. battle lines. Yeah, because technically that's all I basically had. This was pre-internet days. This right. was pre-YouTube days. How, how old were you when, when you went to your first Mormon History Association or Sunstone or something like that? See, at Rick's College is when I first heard about Sunstone, and I rejected them. I said, "Oh no, those are too liberal. Those too are liberal. not. Those people are not following the gospel." What I did was there was a girl in one of my religion classes, Doctrine and Covenants one hundred and one or something, and she started sharing the Sunstone magazine with me, and and I would be reading through some of the articles. I say, "No, no, no, I, I I don't agree with that. No, that's that's not right. That's not right." You know, um, and so we kind of ha started having the discussion, and I told her flat out, "I said, you know, you need to quit." paying attention to them and come and read Hugh Nibley. And she said, read Hugh Nibley. I've had four classes from him. I know him better than you do. And I said, 
Wow. You had classes with you, Nibley? She said, yeah, I transferred from BYU to here because I moved here with my husband because he got a job. So I'm just going to school to fill in my time. So I I sat with her during lunch and had her tell me all about Hugh Nibley. She gave me, this is going to age me, man. I'm not going to tell you that I'm actually almost 63 this January. So I'm going to keep it young. I'm 29. I've been holding there for decades. Nice. But she gave me cassette tapes of some of Hugh Nibley's lectures, classes that she wow. attended. She she was able to record them and she made copies for me. Wow. Do you still have them? Do you still have, have those behind internet. you somewhere in a shoebox? I do. Uh, you don't yeah. have to get them, but that's we'll take your but, word for it. But, but they're here. I I I think she only gave me like four of them. Wow, and, uh, so that's fascinating. She, she said, "Yeah, he was one of the guys that he would come walking in all the while talking. He never shut up." He never shut up before or after class. He he left the class at the end of the class, talking all the way out the hall, down the hall, and into his next class. Wow. But when he walked in, everybody would push the recorders on the front table. There were like 150 of them, and everybody would push their buttons, and then they'd go sit down so that they could get his wow. recording. Wow. <laughs> I would have I I would have felt the same way. Hugh Nibley was the first um resource I read outside of the curriculum of Book of Mormon studies, you know, uh, Old Testament studies, I came across Hugh Nibley and I had the same reaction just because I love to study, study, study. And I think those that want to just get more and more knowledge of where was it and things like that love Hugh Nibley. So I would have probably been a little starstruck over her to know that she took four of his classes and could ask him anything. Because like you said, those books, all of his writings are just so powerful mm. and definitive. And um, I mean, I probably would have fought someone if they said he was an apologetic back then. I, I was like, no, he's just speaking the truth. You know, he, right. he nibbly was just really, I still have a ton of his books. So Me too. I've got them all. I, I collected them. I actually photocopied. I would end up going to BYU. See, Farms, Jack Welch started Farms in 1979 when I was on my mission. Oh. And when I got home and started going to Rick's college, someone introduced me to some materials that was called farms. And I said, I'm not interested in agriculture. And they said, no, 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 no. This is the foundation for ancient <laughs> research and Mormon study shirts. This is right down your alley. Oh, it was my my humanities, my, my, what was the name of his class? Uh, intellectual advance, not intellectual advancement, something with intellectual in it. He was more of a, uh, he was more of a upper crust class. Uh, we studied Oedipus and uh, oh. uh, Homer and we tried to tie it back in with the Book of Mormon and stuff like that. Intellectual. That's research. all. That's all Greek to me. Yeah, it's all. <laughs> it was to me in, too, even in the English. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so he he got me onto farms, mm. and so I started going down there to BYU, getting to know the farms boys, as I call them, and. I, um, John Twetness actually showed me up in the library where a lot of Hugh Nibley's writings were. Now, back then in the BYU library, the public had access to all of the scholarly journals. Hmm. The Zeitschrift for Ägyptische Sprache, the Egyptian archaeology, the 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 stuff on Babylon and Mesopotamia and the cuneiform studies and all wow. there were hundreds of thousands, the, the BYU library and all thanks to Hugh Nibley. He's the one that got BYU's library serious about becoming a research library. I got to track down hundreds and hundreds of these scholarly articles that he used in his message of the Joseph Smith papyri and in, in his an approach to the Book of Mormon, etc. I actually tracked down the original articles and got wow. to read them also from BYU. Wow. So, yeah, it was quite fun. So I felt like I was a hot shot. And then along came the internet. 
And that was all it took to get me sucked into the apologetics. I had been studying my whole life and I, I thought I actually knew my stuff. So I decided now's the time I can test you nibbly. Let's get on the internet and uh, let's. So when did you do your first Mormon history association? Nineteen ninety-nine. I didn't go to a lot of those conferences. I didn't I ended up not liking Sunstone. I did like dialogue parts of it because, of course, Nibley's material in there on the Joseph Smith papyri in the book of Abraham. Right. Right. And uh, some of his stuff on the Old Testament was in the dialogue, uh, Journal of Mormon Thought. So but yeah, I didn't really go to a lot of the, con I still don't really, and now I just don't have the flipping time. But so once the internet came along, we all, I was testing out Hugh Nibley's materials and just absolutely destroying everybody's arguments, but I wasn't converting anybody, but it impressed everyone. So we kind of bandied together and, and I'm one of the original founders of FAIR, the Foundation for Apologetic Information and wow. Research. Yeah, now they're called Fair Mormon, but yeah. I'm one of the original three founders. Fair, Darryl, well, fair LDS, right? Now they're Fair <laughs> LDS. Oh, oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> keep up, keep up, keep up, yeah. Gary. What's See, going that's on? why that's why I'm no longer with them because once we had uh, Scott Gordon in there as president, he he said we're going to conform to the brethren and we're going to do their will and uh, we're going to have a 70 in on the board of directors and Daryl and Julianne and I started fair with the absolute firm intent of remaining completely independent of the church but yet we would be supportive but that didn't last very long and then we had arguments and so I kind of I walked away so, so anyway how do you how did you start how did you go from being the founder of, I mean, really one of the biggest, if not the biggest defenders of the church and the doctrine to yeah. starting to kind of question, getting yourself kind of wobbling a bit. What, what happened there? Uh, probably the things that stand out the most to me at this point, it's been a while. Oh my goodness. Uh, one of them was some of the, no, we had a private email list behind the scenes that no one except fair members were allowed to be involved with. And what we would do, of course, we would put all our resources together and we would work through some issues that we found on the internet. And then we would write, we would collab together on a paper or an article, and then we would publish yeah. it on the fair site, right? So one of the things that began to happen is they, and we had some very famous Mormons, Van Hale of Mormon Miscellaneous joined, and they kicked him off the list because he was a completely faithful, temple-attending, tithe-paying Mormon, but he didn't believe that the Book of Mormon was historical. Wow. And they said, no, you have to believe that or you're, you're, you're off the list. And I, and I turned around and I asked him, I go, well, you can't start kicking people off the email list for, <laughs> for their belief. And they said, the heck we can't. We sure can. And then Kevin wow. Graham, who was one of the most sturdy apologists, Kevin Graham, one of the great researchers. I mean, that kid could really do a number. He was fabulous. And, and I loved working with him. He asked some questions about the papyri. Mm -hmm. And John Gee, of course, all of the farms people ended up being on the list too. John Gee and Dan Peterson, John Twetness, and you know, all of them, Bill Hamlin. And this was before Kerry Mulstein came on the scene, though, or now Stephen Smoot. So this was way back in the, the early 2000s. Uh, Kevin was asking John about some of the relationships with the papyri in the book of Abraham. And John would present his view. And then he would say, well, uh, it's in the farms review of books. And uh, I'm getting my, I, I published that information. And so Kevin would go through that and he kept 
needling John. He said, well, now this doesn't make sense because that's not what the witnesses actually said. You're playing a little bit fast and loose with the material. We were trying to help each other make the strongest case possible. John, for whatever reason, according to Kevin, Kevin felt like John was not being totally honest mm. with the answers, not only to us on the fair mail list, but in his publications. So Kevin Graham is the one who gets the credit for contacting Robert Rittner. Oh, wow. And asking him, what about this argument? And that's how he had, got involved. Wow. Yes. Rittner had no idea John Gee, his student, was actually writing what he was writing. So Kevin wow. made sure Rittner got a hold of John's stuff. And, of course, that was the beginning of the end of John <laughs> Gee's credibility. But that's how Rittner got involved. Yeah. So they kicked wow. Kevin off of the email list. Wow. I said, wait a minute. You guys can't keep doing this. And they said, yes, we can. And so one time, uh, this was when I do believe Christopher Hitchens was very popular. And on the list, we kind of hinted. We said, oh, well, you know, don't worry about uh, I." I asked a couple of questions about some atheist issues and they said, Oh, well, you know, the atheists, they've all been answered and none of them have any validity. So don't worry about it. And it finally, uh, it finally dawned on me. Well, okay. What specifically, when I would ask their questions, they would say, Oh, well, no, that that's not worth looking into right now. That's a ridiculous stance. You know that the gospel's true and stuff like that. And we've all read the atheist. And I finally got that's to right. where I asked. God is, God is not on the atheist side. Which one? Yeah. That, that was basically the answer. Which one atheist have you guys actually read? And it dawned on me by their answers. Read any. No, nobody's here reading the atheists at all. Nobody read Christopher Hitchens. So, so I went and read it was Dan Barker's book, Godless. That's the name Godless. of it. That was the first atheist book I ever read all the way through. And I was shocked at how powerful it was. Wow. Reasoning wise, and I just had no idea. And so I came back and I said, um, "You guys haven't read a thing on atheism, have you? You're you're just kind of throwing out platitudes and stuff." Because I just got done finished reading this atheist book, and he is so powerful, I can't believe it. This is incredible. This blows us out of the water. And then I got into the biblical materials, the biblical scholars. And they're using the Hebrew and the Greek. Uh, um, Raymond Brown and Joseph mm -hmm. Fitzmeyer, the Dead Sea Scrolls scholars, James C. Vanderkam, uh, people like that, uh, James H. Charlesworth. And I asked, why aren't we writing these books? Why is it the non-Mormon scholars who are putting together the real good mm -hmm. stuff? Yeah. And there were some who just actually came right out and said, oh, well, the brethren don't want to study in the Hebrew and the Greek. Wow. I'm like, what? Joseph Smith himself studied the Hebrew. What do you mean the brethren don't? No, we're, 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 they don't, they don't like it when we study the biblical languages. And that's when I realized something's wrong in River City. Yeah. So I could, I couldn't stay, I couldn't stay. I can't do group think. I'll put it that way. So that was basically the beginning of the end. And then through a few more years, I, I went quiet and, and I apostatized. I apostatized. I found the light. I don't even let them tell me what my status is. I am not an apostate. I am a seeker of the further light and knowledge that father promised. That's how I put it to him. Mm -hmm. no, no, you don't get to label me anymore. Faithful or faithless. Uh, uh, no, I'll label what I am. That's how I do this. So well, it's it's really interesting. Oh, Gene, I think you're muted. Yeah. One Hold of the early things. Yeah, one of the early things I remember was that 
the backyard professor would go around to Mormon History Association and interview people in the hallways. Yeah, that was at the fair conferences. Also. Fair yeah, conferences. Yeah, 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 the fair conferences, yes. And I did. And those videos are still available on my website. They're wow. just the real, real, real old early ones from like 18 years ago. I've never taken any stuff off my website because it's part of who I was and who I am. And it's my journey. And so if people want to see it, the cool thing is now that I've come to see the actual reality is now I get to go back and refute my former apologetic self because <laughs> I made a thousand apologetic videos. I mean that literally Amazing. numerically. I made a thousand of them. So. And do you think anyway. that being a, a searcher of truth and someone who really does research but wasn't apologetic, do you think that's because you kind of stayed within that that echo chamber? Is that what it was? Because I could just imagine the cognitive dissonance gets so strong when you start to see real research versus what you've been kind of fed unless you don't go to the real research, right? You stay within the Hugh Nibley books and the – you know, when you read those, it's like, oh, this just makes sense. Um, yeah. Did you find that 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 started kind of taking over when you started looking at outside sources or started seeing people deleted from these emails that they were asking outside things? Is that what kind of turned the cognitive dissonance off for you? It, it, it did. Um, one of the really interesting things was I became real good friends with uh, – John Twetness and Matt Roper at Farms, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I still look. John's dead now. Matt's still still alive. He's still alive and kicking. I think he's at Book of Mormon Central. But John, one time, I would go down there two or three times a summer just to do research and hang out with him. Hey, what's your latest research? And, all? and he would tell me, hey, see this book, get this book. And other times he would actually have an extra copy of the book. He'd say, here, take this with you. You'll love this. So, um. John one time sat me down and he goes, I've got a paper and I had it in my hands. He, he gave me a paper to look at and he's, and, and I was looking through it and I go, oh, nice. Another Ezekiel 37 stick of Joseph paper. That's cool. That's great. So what did you find looking at the original Hebrew? And for whatever reason, he never, we never took the time. I'm, I, I regret that to this day because now it's underground. It's, it's hidden. It's in the cement vault. It's not coming out. John Twetness as a biblical scholar, and that's the one cool thing about John, is he really did just say, where does the Hebrew take us? And go there. And he said, uh, I've studied all the Hebrew, carry all I can. And he said, I've got bad news for you. The stick of Joseph prophecy in Ezekiel 37 does not work. Mm. He said, that's, that's not what it's about. I think uh, Dan McClellan is. Dan um, McClellan, yeah. Yeah. Is I sort sat, of taking I that rain, yep. the reins of that type of uh, scholarly I, approach. I sat back and people. I go, well, what, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I've tried to publish it. He said, they won't let me publish it. Wow. And they never did let him publish it. So, yeah. and then he turned around and says something else that just blew my mind. He said, um, technically, you know, off the record, off the record. Technically, none of the Old Testament has anything at all to do with anything with the church. There are no biblical prophecies of Mormonism, angel Moroni, gold plates, seer stones, whatever. He said all of that is read back into the record. He said right. the, anci the ancient Jews did not even know about Jesus. Their writings were for the yeah. people of their times. Yeah. I'm going, whoa, John, you got to be <laughs> careful. You're treading it's thin like, ice here. In you. He said, well, they, they've made sure I don't publish any of this. So, and and that wow. kind of that kind of peeved me off. I said, "Oh, wait a minute! I mean, if it's if it's valid research, I said, oh, it's it's valid research, all right, but it doesn't come to faithful answers, and we're all about being faithful to the church." That's right. So, so you left fair, and then you kind of like stood by on the sidelines for a little while, and then you were brought back into podcasting. How'd that happen? Quite, quite a while. Well, um, like I say, I got. Uh, Dan Barker's book, Godless, read it, and nobody would touch it, and nobody could refute it. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, um, 
why stop there? So I I do have okay, forgive me. This is a backyard professor trick. <laughs> I'm gonna do it just for you guys. I apologize to your audience. We're on the move. No, no, no apology. Dingling, but this is what we do. I, I'm gonna show you. I'm not kidding. There are all wow. of my atheist books. Wow. Now, that's one shelf, and then there's the other. So I've got about wow. 80, 80 books of atheist stuff. And I read right. every, every blink in one of them. I read them all. They're but fabulous. You, you stopped. Um, you stopped producing things, but you didn't stop reading. Oh no, no, I, I, I ne I'll never stop reading. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I quit. I realized, well, ah, apologetics just isn't my thing. It's not for me. And then, quite frankly, um, I, I wanted to. I mean, it was fun because it made you look, uh intelligent and intellectual with your other fellow Mormon apologists and fellow Mormons. So I, I tried to become an expert in the book of Abraham and the papyri and the facsimiles, right? Because with symbolism, man, you can make anything say anything and mean anything. So in fact, simile number two, and this is where Steve Smoot's at because he said so publicly on a recent podcast, his favorite facsimile is facsimile number two because of the symbolism and the cosmology and the astronomy and all of that. And it verifies Joseph Smith. I know exactly where he's coming from. I was there. Yeah. It dawned on me when I read this book. Egyptian papyri. This is Robert Rittner. Yep. Joseph Smith, Egyptian papyri, a complete edition. It dawned on me, wait a minute. Um, I have been reading the apologists, the Kerry Mulsteins, the John Gies, the Hugh Nibleys. I read everything Hugh Nibley ever published at least a dozen times, especially his message of the Joseph Smith papyri and his new new improvement era or, or the improvement era articles mm -hmm. on this, you know, the books of Enoch, the book of Abraham. It dawned on me, you know, I've read the apologist so much, and I've never really actually understood the actual relationship of the papyri with the book of Abraham until I read this. And then it dawned on me. I've been had because it is unfortunate that it is the Mormon apologists themselves who are making this vastly more complicated than it actually is. Yeah. And so Robert Rittner straightened me out there. And that was my shelf breaker. The book of a, I'm one of those. Yeah, I know. I, I get it. I'm one of those. It is the book of Abraham that broke my shelf. And, and I can declare, and I know Stephen Smoot's on record saying uh, that he, he completely disagrees and he thinks we're overstating the case. So let me say it again, just as clearly as I know how. This war is over, and you Mormons lost. The book of Abraham did not succeed. It's yeah. fake. The, the papyri is the evidence. The Kirtland Egyptian papers is the evidence. It's unfortunate, but the game is over. The stadium is empty, and you guys are still out there trying to pass a football and give hand each other the handoff to get a touchdown and the lights are turned off. It's over. The papyri you know? is, is just a funerary text for Horace. The, yeah. papyri, the papyri is the smoking gun. And we do have the original. We really genuinely do. And we've got lots of Egyptological evidence for that. Not just Rittner. I mean, uh, Thomas Meckes and uh, Kara Cooney out of UCLA, who was involved in Egyptology with Carrie Mulstein. So she's got some good background on Carrie Mulstein. But none of the Egyptologists agree with the with the Mormon. The brand new BYU studies um, edition that was just put out last spring, almost a year ago now, 
did not save the book of Abraham. And, and I've been reading in it and I'm, I'm going to do some updates on it, but I just did a, a recent video on my website. There's a the, budding group of uh, historians that say that Harry Potter was not really a wizard. That's what I'm understanding. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, from what so, that I, to be honest, if you read the essay from the church of the book of Abraham, I think that that kind of put the nail in the coffin. I know they're trying to soften it up with other dissertations language. after the mm -hmm. fact, but when people read that essay, I mean, it's either, it's either it is or it isn't. Yeah. And the essay and that, try to soften it off, but when you're raised to say that this is what it is, you can't. Right give other explanations down the road exactly right and work. and that that essay um actually mormonish land and brophy and uh rebecca, rebecca. Bell, rebecca okay. and i we are going to be we're doing uh podcasts on the essay in fact tonight we're doing the one on violence and early mormonism on oh my, my gosh i love Co that essay that Co essay come is on, amazing come on over to to the backyard professor live at six o'clock tonight we'll be on with mormonish but we're going through each one of the essays and uh, we're taking it from this the gospel topic series discussing the essay so we will be discovering that book of abraham essay but i am here to tell you fundamentally from my personal experience and all of my personal reading that essay is not what we were saying in the early 2000s in any manner whatsoever so the, the conclusion word, the word translation just doesn't mean what you thought it meant right yeah all of that kind of fudging now that is now going on mm -hmm. no it wasn't when i was an apologist it really wasn't things have really changed and what has changed the nature of the approach is the apologists cannot refute the obvious Egyptological evidence that has come out yeah. since John Gee got his PhD. I'm not talking since you Nibley. I mean, it comes up even closer now. Now we're talking what John Gee began in his early career and what he was saying is no longer viable either. They've been virtually forced to change the apologetic on the book of Abraham well, because you at, of the evidence. You also look at, you know, DNA and what happened with Lamanites. I still have my um, original book of Mormon from, well, my quad from when I was baptized in the, in the nineties. And it says in there who the Lamanites are. Absolutely. And now my child who gets her quad, it says, you know, our, some or primary, whatever they've changed the language. To. Right, right. Um, they have so too. it seems like science is kind of messing up Heavenly Father's grand plan. Um, absolutely. I hate absolutely. when they do that. And when I when I so I was so I was so I can't say shocked. I was just disillusioned. I'll put it that way. And and yeah, all of us go through an anger phase. I get that. And, and my anger phase lasted for a few years. I actually read through the atheist materials, getting angrier and angrier. And then it finally just dawned on me. And I, you know, uh, this will be for another podcast. Af after reading them for a while and, and being what I consider to be atheist for four and a half, five years or whatever. And I even ridiculed others who told me what I'm telling you right now. So I'm probably going to get ridiculed now too. But I told them, I said, well, you weren't a real atheist then if you're no longer an atheist because they've destroyed everything we were taught, right? So now here I am saying, yeah, but after four and a half years, atheism isn't the final answer either. So I consider myself to be um, I can honestly say with a clear conscience and it, and it's it's the freedom of being out of the dogma and being able to enjoy the data, Dan McClellan, data over dogma. It's that freedom that says, I don't know, yeah. but it's okay. I'm seeking. I'll be open. I'll, I'll, I'm available if God actually does want to come down and say, yo, hey, Carrie, come here, come here. I got to show you something, you dipstick. <laughs> <laughs> you idiot, you're so off base. Uh, I'm open to anything at that point, but, but I am searching, I am seeking, I am continually trying to learn, and I too agree with the idea of data over dogma, so.
Um, so, but but are, I will be I will be dogmatic with one thing, and there's no question about this, and that is with the evidence and where it leads. Mm -hmm. Not about an interpretation, but about the evidence. Now, that's provisional because, of course, we're all finite and we're all human, and that's all good because. If new evidence comes along that shows I am wrong about the book of Abraham and the relationship with the papyri, et cetera, I am more than happy to take wherever it leads. But I can't get dogmatic with a so-called testimony that short circuits the evidence. That's cheating, in my opinion, and that's just my view, but I, I just, I can't go there anymore. So right. anyway, so what were you asking me? Yeah. So you, you stopped doing the apologetics. You kept on producing YouTube because you were doing your chess, chess. Yeah. Um, shows. And then what got you back into Mormon and, land of and, podcasting? And, and I still am into the chess. I'm going harder mm -hmm. than ever before now. So um, because it's just, it's something I love to do, but uh, I'm no good at it, but I'm getting there. So uh, I'm on a message board, uh, Shades message board. I've been there for about a decade. And this this strange guy, Consiglieri, starts showing up posting. And, and he is interesting, and he is witty, and he is funny. And he's talking about another guy, Bill Reel. And I thought they were both the same people for a while. Mm -hmm. I didn't pay much attention to him, but then all of a sudden someone started talking about the podcast of Radio Free Mormon, and I had no idea who that was. And then I found out that Consiglieri was Radio Free Mormon, and uh, this guy started asking me to come on to his podcast to tell my story. I said, oh, no, I don't, I don't have a story. It's all good. Don't. No, I'm a nobody. Don't worry about me. So he bugged me for quite a few years. <laughs> and I that just, was Consiglieri? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, Consiglieri. And and then mm -hmm. as Radio Free Mormon, he said, look, I've got a podcast. I really want you on the show. Don't sell yourself short. And I said, all right, all right. I finally agreed to do it. And that's after we did the show, we both agreed we would approach Bill Real and see if I could get back into podcasting on Mormon stuff. So I did that with, with them for about a year and a half. And now I'm back out on my own program, on my own show with the Mormonism stuff, as well as the chess. And now I, I am also doing uh, fantasy art with artificial intelligence combined with my skills, human intelligence. I call it AI art, A I H I, and wow. it's a lot of fun. It's uh, I've got a few videos on my website, thebackyardprofessor.com, that show my AI art and how I'm able to to draw with artificial intelligence. Wow, uh, it, it, it's a lot of fun. So I, I've right. got a. A poster coming out with uh, superhero Mormon Even, podcasters. Eventually, I hope. I, I haven't worked on it now for several months. I uh, I just kind of put it on the back shelf for, for a bit. But, yeah, I, I do a lot of caricatures. And I need to get you two in there, too. You're two lovely people. I would love yeah. to make caricatures. <laughs> of. When you started the poster, we weren't even a in our we radar to start yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, but you are now. You're part of the family. That's right. <laughs> so so Carrie, that's, that's my story in a nutshell. I'm, if you I'm were, back. If you were to say um, what maybe the top thing that you're trying to do with your podcast is right now, as it stands right now, what would you say that is for your audience? Well, a lot of my audience has kind of helped guide me into what I'm trying to do now as opposed to what i was doing Before. Uh, even a year ago there are a lot of people who are just genuinely lost because they can no longer believe and that's a scary place to be and 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 every now and then no joke that still does come cropping up in my heart and soul too uh, it's scary and and that's sad, but that's the reality because nobody wants 
to go to hell and suffer. Let's just face the music. Nobody wants to come up short and be in the telestial kingdom or the terrestrial kingdom, etc. And so there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of guilt. The social issues, as important as they are, to me personally, end up being... It's a disaster. It's a PR disaster for the church leadership. They need to just quit going to the social issues because they are just blowing it every time they open their mouths from my side of things. The doctrinal issues, the historical issues, the... <laughs> How do you, I'm trying to be charitable here. I, I swear to goodness, I really am. The hypocrisy that's the best that's what you call a liar a hypocrite okay um if if the gospel of truth if the church of jesus christ of latter day saints has to lie in order to convince you that it has the truth then houston we have a problem I'm not kidding, man. Let's face it. If you have to lie to convince people you're the truth, yeah, there's something wrong. Or or hide truth. Not even or lie, hide, but hide the truth hide. because yeah. you don't want people to know. They're trying to make it so kindergarten simple and dumb us down that it's offensive. I protest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we are adults here. Give it to us. And quit your pee-picking dogma of saying, well, you have to believe it this way or you're not doing it God's way because God tells us. I don't buy that anymore because of the way they talk and act. I don't believe they even believe Jesus is doing a lot right now. You know what I mean? I mean, Holland, a few years back, he was so angry. He was just living. I hate it when people apostatize from the church. Yeah. And yet you go, wait a minute. It's the gospel <laughs> of obedience, not oh. the gospel of love. There you yeah. boy, right, right there, Gene. Yeah. If Holland actually believed Jesus was running the church, how could he possibly get that angry over anything? That yeah. doesn't make sense to me. And that was one of the other things that I said, oh, wait, their actual reaction, the rescue missions. We're going to have the Swedish rescue mission, the, the Boise, Idaho re rescue missions, re right. rescue missions. Wait, you, you're saying you have the Holy Ghost on your side. You're saying Jesus has hot chocolate and donuts with you every Thursday morning in the upper rooms of the Salt Lake Temple running the church. That's what my dad raised me to believe. I'm mm -hmm. serious. I mean, literally, every week, Jesus was showing up, guiding them on how to run the church. Well, if that was really actual, in either scenario, if the Holy Ghost really can teach you the truth and you wouldn't stray, etc., you can't possibly say and do what you're doing right now. Yeah. If you really believe Jesus is in charge, they don't believe that. They wouldn't be doing and saying what they're saying. When Bill Hamblin, one of the BYU scholars who I was also good friends with, uh, defender of the faith. He was he was known as Dan Peterson's lieutenant. They were buddy buddies in the apologetic scheme at farms, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. I mean, they were fr good friends. And so Bill Hamblin actually came out on his blog and said that the board of directors, he was absolutely livid. In fact, I do believe this is what caused him to retire from BYU early. He didn't even wait it out. He said, this is just... This is ridiculous. And I do believe his blog is still up. I'm, I'll have to look. Hopefully, I don't get it shut down from admitting this. But when, and this was after I had left fair and all that, I was reading his blog. He said the board of directors of BYU told the farms group, we are not giving you your uh, raises 
You're not going to make extra money for doing your apologetic work. We do not want you defending the Book of Mormon. We don't give a flying flip about its ancientness or authenticity. Wow. We don't want any of that. Bill Hamblin came unglued and complained about it on his public blog. And you know what I told everybody? I said, if, if. I were still involved in apologetics the moment I read that blog entry. I would have put my butt in my car. I would have sped down to Provo at 190 miles an hour. I would have knocked on Hamlin's door and I would have said, you get that blog off. You turn that off. You are letting the cat out of the bag. Uh, yeah. The reason why is because the board of directors of BYU are the 12 apostles. Yeah. And they're telling their own apologist, quit defending the Book of Put Mormon. It out. We don't want it to be ancient or just authentic. We don't, we, we don't care anymore. We just need to maintain faith. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that they can't. They can't take that stance if they really know Jesus is running the show. Yeah. And I started, in, in other words, I don't, yeah. believe, I don't believe anything they say anymore about even seeing Jesus or talking to Jesus. I don't believe it. Yeah. They wouldn't act the way they are. That's how it works. So, yeah. So what podcast do you listen to now and, and are your favorites or podcasts that kind of, you know, you mentioned RFM, you mentioned Bill. Real. Yeah. I, I, I listen to a little bit of all of them when I have time. Um, I, I can't, I'm trying to work toward retirement in another 88 years. I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, I'm only 29 and holding. I've been there yeah. for decades. So, so yeah, yeah I, Mac I started Mac. late. So, right. I'm, so, um, but I, I listen to, uh, I, I listen to quite a bit of all of them. Uh, a, li a little bit of all of them. I don't know if I have a, a favorite podcast. I would advise people the, the glory, in my opinion, the real fun of all of this mm -hmm. on the YouTube with the podcast and stuff is exactly the variety that's available. Yeah. You know. That's cool. And I know everybody wants to be the biggest and the best. Well, none of us are going to catch John DeLynn. And even if we do, that's not the issue. It's not about how big and glorious we become. It's about helping people navigate their faith crisis. But it's like that saying, and I can't get it out of my head. And I've repeated it several times, and I'll repeat it again right here, right now, with a smile on my face. I did not have a faith crisis. The church is having a truth crisis. That's how that works. The fault is not me. Well, you're an apostate. Well, that implies there's something wrong with me. Well, mm -hmm. you've lost your faith. Well, that implies I'm lesser than. I don't buy any of that brainwashed bunk anymore. Uh -uh. No, you don't get to label me. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm going through. And I know why I'm going the way I'm going. And I love helping other people recognize that your value is based on who you are are not who you associate with. Right. Your value is based on who you are, not what you are. Well, I'm a Mormon, or I'm an apologist, or I'm a, an apostle, or whatever. That's not where the value lies. But the church wants you to think that's where the value lies. Well, and that's where there's the identity crisis, right? Because identity, identity crisis. is there's, there's no the longer world. you. It's, that's it's that's why that we're you have in. no control yeah. over. Yeah, that's why we're in this. That's why I do this is to help. And I've had several people tell me, "Thank you, thank you, thank you." Uh, and, and I'm not one of the big boys. I'm not one of the most popular, or whatever. But I, I keep doing my show because there's hundreds of people who say thank you and say, "Man, I feel better about myself thanks to you." And and I'm grateful for that. 
Uh, but it's not thanks to me so much as it's the willingness to stay open-minded. And, and I know I hate using that word because that can come back and bite you in the butt. Um, it's not about being open-minded. It's about being willing to be who you are without trying to be fake for someone else's sake. If you do what everyone else in the church leadership wants you to do, you're going to make them happy. And yes, they'll praise you and lavish you with celestial blessings and priesthood glory and all that. But what about your happiness? You can make them happy. But the minute you start trying to live your authentic life, then they label you. And that's what I'm rejecting. I'm telling people, you don't have to buy that baloney. It's just a label. Let it go. So That's right. Well, thanks, Carrie, for, you know, holding back and being politically correct. Someday we'll yeah. have you back on the show and we'll let you tell us what you really think. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get rotten tomatoes everywhere. But, you know, that's part of the other problem. Political correctness does not equate to truth. Yeah. The truth has never been politically correct. So I've never really worried about that. So I hope I don't get you guys in trouble. With yeah. And, and looking at you and your background, you know, people that we consider educated are people that mm -hmm. we say are well read. Right. I don't know of an expert that ever read one book over and over and over and over again that became an expert in anything. You have to read a wide variety of books. You have to see a wide variety of podcasts. You have to experience things. You have to listen to what other people's opinions are. I remember when I was young, I would say, this is what I think. And then after I stopped talking, I thought to myself, that didn't sound right. Maybe I don't really think that. But you have to start somewhere. And I think right. that yeah. podcasters and people who write books and people who are doing TikToks and other things are – you know, they're putting themselves out there. They're being brave. That's what, you know, Ladder Daily Digest is about, is to get people to see a little bit of, of here and there and everywhere. And, you know, hopefully yeah. people can um, get uh, not a homogenous, you know, amount of uh, ideas and thoughts, but just more into their lives so that they can use their brain. If God yeah. gave you a brain, he wants you to use it or she wants you to use it. And so... So we're really happy to have you. And thanks, yeah. Summer, for um, yeah. joining me today. Of course, and of course. Everybody do the usual like and subscribe. And um, and we'll see you the next time on Ladder Daily Digest. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you guys again. See you.